we have Christmas Eve, why don't we have Thanksgiving Eve? We should have that, right? It was the day before Thanksgiving and all through the room. Not a student was studying, they felt the oncoming doom, I guess. I just made that up. That's why it's a little weak. So, um, I hope all of you have places to go for Thanksgiving, but if you don't have a place to go for Thanksgiving, you have an invitation to come to my house. Uh, so if you would like to come and have turkey tomorrow, please let me know after class, and I would be happy to have you over. Um, yeah, everybody goes, well, have some turkey with Ahern, right? <clears throat> Seriously, uh, if, you, if you're interested, let me know. Okay, so this is probably the least attended class of the whole term, uh, and this is the one class where anybody who's here says, oh, do I give extra credit today, which I won't do. Uh, so... Um, but I figure if you come to class today, we should have a little fun. So we'll have a little fun today, and we won't do too heavy uh, of a load of uh, lifting, as it were. Okay? Now everybody's happy, right? So what I want to do to start is just very briefly uh, go over what I mentioned last time regarding the new reactions of gluconeogenesis. And the new reactions of gluconeogenesis involved four enzymes that replaced three enzymes of glycolysis. If we start with pyruvate, and as I noted, we can start from a variety of places, but the most common place we talk about starting from is pyruvate. The enzyme that catalyzes that reaction is pyruvate carboxylase. It uses a biotin cofactor. Oh, by the way, uh, I did promise, I think after the um, last overview, that I would do these overviews again. I'm not doing it this week for obvious reasons because nobody's here, and it's... Um, also uh, a, a compressed week, but I will do an overview. I'll schedule an overview in the evening sometime next week uh, for people, okay? Oh, that's not me. Okay, so back to pyruvate carboxylase. Uh, pyruvate carboxylase uh, is found in the um, endoplasmic reticulum. I'm sorry, it's found in the mitochondria. I'm, my, I'm totally screwed up. It's found in the mitochondrion, which means that this reaction occurs in the mitochondrion. After the oxaloacetate is made, the oxaloacetate is moved out into the cytoplasm for uh, the next reaction, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit next term, actually. Um, this reaction requires energy from ATP. We know the role of the biotin that I talked about was carrying the bicarbonate or carbon dioxide, as you can see here. And uh, that's a very common reaction in carboxylation reactions, as they talked about. The second reaction uh, was uh, that shown on the screen here, which is the uh, decarboxylation of oxaloacetate to form phosphoenolpyruvate, or PEP. That energy also requires, uh, that energy, that, that reaction also requires energy in the form of GTP. And by the way, some places you'll see ATP. It depends on the organism in terms of whether they use ATP or GTP. Don't get too hung up on that. ATP and GTP are hung, are, are, are hung up, are um, equivalent in terms of energy, okay? And um, this reaction occurs in mitochondria. This does not occur in the mitochondria. Ahern, what are you doing? All right. Occurs in cytoplasm. Okay. And back to that, save that, go back there. Okay, so it occurs in the cytoplasm, as do all the other reactions going up to the very last one, which occurs um, in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so these, we're using two triphosphates to get around that pyruvate kinase reaction. Very, very important thing to do, because that pyruvate kinase reaction has a bundle of energy we've got to get around to make work, and so it, to, to, to make happen. So having these two uh, triphosphates going into making it enables the bypassing of the pyruvate kinase reaction. There's the decarboxylation. Third reaction is way up at the PFK. So instead of the reversing the PFK reaction, this reaction involves the removal of a phosphate from uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to create fructose 6-phosphate. And this reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme known as, by a variety of names, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is the one I prefer. You also see FBPase, and I think that's not very descriptive, so I prefer to call it FBPase 1. And you'll see there's an FBPase 2 that comes up later. Okay? This reaction is not the reversal 
of the PFK reaction, as I mentioned. Um, and the cell is actually saving energy by not remaking that ATP, which would be required for the reversal of the reaction. And it's simply clipping the phosphate off using a hydrolysis reaction with water. Okay. All right. The same thing happens in the very last reaction. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme known as glucose 6-phosphatase. This reaction occurs in the mitochondrion. And in the mitochondrion, um, mitochondrion, wait, I, somebody just hit the reset button on me today, would you please? This reaction occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. Maybe if I would go to my own slides, it would tell me that, and I would, wouldn't even be saying the wrong thing. It doesn't say it there. There it is. Okay, it occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. And like the, PA, like the uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase reaction, the cell saves energy by not regenerating the ATP, which would be necessary if the uh, hexokinase reaction were reversed. Instead, phosphate is clipped off of there using water, just like we saw in the, in the uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase reaction, and glucose is produced. Okay? Now, I should mention, and I'm not sure I mentioned it very clearly in class, but glucose is not made in all cells of the body. It's very important to remember that. Glucose is made primarily in the liver and some cells of your kidney. Okay? The rest of your body depends upon your liver to maintain glucose levels. Glucose is a poison, particularly in high concentrations. So the liver plays a role in lowering those glucose concentrations if glucose levels are high. And the, and the liver plays a role in uh, increasing those glucose concentrations if glucose blood con concentrations are low. Very, very important fact. All right? So your skin cells are not making glucose. Your muscle cells are not making glucose. And importantly, your brain and eye cells are not making glucose. Your brain and eyes take up a pretty good percentage of the overall energy that your body needs. So they need glucose, and they rely upon the liver to make it and deliver it to them via the bloodstream. Very, very important thing. So gluconeogenesis reactions don't occur okay, in all cells. The PEPCK enzyme, the second enzyme that I talked about, is not made in all cells. So you would predict, for example, that you wouldn't see it occurring in liver cells, uh, occurring in muscle cells. You wouldn't see it occurring in brain cells. But you would see it occurring in liver cells. Okay. The overall summary of the pathway of glycolysis that we've talked about is on the screen. Glucose plus two ADP plus two phosphates and two NADs yield two pyruvates, two ATPs, two NADHs, two protons, and two waters. Okay? If we look at the yields of gluconeogenesis, we start with the endpoints of glycolysis. We start with two pyruvates. We start with two NADHs. But instead of needing two triphosphates, we need four triphosphates. And I have four ATPs because four ATPs are equivalent to two ATPs and two GTPs. The end product of that is our starting material for glycoly glycolysis, which is glucose plus two NADs. Um, now, what does that mean if we take this reaction and we run it? Well, it means that every time we go through a cycle of going from glucose down to pyruvate and pyruvate back up to glucose, that we're going to waste four triphosphates. And you might wonder what's those other two. I, I should have explained that. We got four ATPs plus two GTPs. Is that wrong? The answer is not wrong. Okay. All right. Because in the um, phosphoglycerate kinase reaction, when we run it backwards, we're using ATP to make 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. That was, that was the reversal of the um, substrate-level phosphorylation in glycolysis. Okay? So we have four ATPs, two GTPs. Out of, the, out of the glycolysis direction, from glycolysis down to pyruvate, we get a total of two ATPs. And in going from pyruvate back to glucose, we require six triphosphates. That means, therefore, that we have um, a net, uh, we have a net, I can't even say this, 
we have a net loss of four triphosphates every time we do that whole cycle. Glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, all right? That cycle doesn't do anything but produce heat and waste triphosphates. Now, if you're trying to make heat, that makes some sense. And there are times when there are organisms that use a cycle like that to generate heat. In general, organisms don't want to be making heat that way because they're doing nothing but making heat. And more importantly, they're losing triphosphates every time they run that cycle. So such a cycle is what I call a feudal cycle, F-U-T-I-L-E. And feudal cycles are that. They're totally feudal. You don't want to have breakdown cycles going at the same time and same place as synthesis cycles. Because if you have that, then you have basically um, uh, wasted energy. So cells have some pretty elaborate controls in place to prevent futile cycles from happening. Okay, we've seen a little bit of it already in something I've called reciprocal regulation. I'm going to show you some more. We'll see it both in these two pathways, and we'll also see it in, a glyc in um, a glycogen metabolism. Okay? So futile cycles are to be avoided unless you're wanting to make heat. Okay. Here's an example of a very simple futile cycle. It's one I've already talked about, but I didn't call it a futile cycle at the time. The pyruvate kinase reaction from glycolysis on the left generates ATP. Okay. The cycle on the right okay, that uh, was used to bypass the, the pyruvate kinase reaction uses an ATP and it uses a GTP. The product of the cycle on the right is PEP. The product of the cycle on the left is pyruvate. If we don't control these two reactions, they're going to go on at the same time, and these two alone are going to make more heat than anything else, over and over and over and over. Because you know that that Big Bang reaction of PEP and going to pyruvate is very energetically favorable. It will release a fair amount of heat. Okay. So this is why the cells regulate the last step of glycolysis. Because if they can't control that pyruvate kinase reaction, they will not be able to make glucose in gluconeogenesis, period. All right? Very important point. If they can't regulate pyruvate kinase, they will not be able to make glucose. Because as soon as they make any PEP, it's going to get converted right back into pyruvate. So very, very important for cells to be able to turn off that pyruvate kinase reaction. Because cells spend a fair amount of energy, or I shouldn't say energy, effort in controlling that pyruvate kinase reaction, they also have to have some cool ways of turning it on. Because the pyruvate kinase reaction is important for glycolysis. And that's why we see feed forward activation affecting pyruvate kinase. So when we get right down to it, pyruvate kinase has some very interesting things metabolically for us to consider. Okay. Here's another view of the two pathways. And, and uh, a student I worked with actually constructed this herself. I've never seen anybody else do it quite like she did. And it looks a little confusing to begin. But after you see the organizational scheme, I think you'll understand why she did it the way that she did it. It was a very, very intelligent um, uh, uh, thing on her part. Her name's Aaliyah. And the idea here is if we go from left to right and we follow the orange arrows, we're going in the direction of glycolysis. Okay? So we start with glucose, we get to fructose 6-phosphate, and then we see the, the, the enzyme phosphofructokinase, which is a regulated enzyme, which is an enzyme that is not found in gluconeogenesis. Okay? We, get, we, we produce with that enzyme fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate goes through multiple steps going upwards until it gets to phosphoenyl pyruvate. And at phosphoenyl pyruvate, if we follow the glycolysis direction, pyruvate kinase catalyzes the production of pyruvate. Now what she's superimposed, and she hasn't shown hexokinase, because as I said, hexokinase regulation is a little odd, and we just don't, I don't put it on here. All right? What she's shown on here are the allosteric effectors 
of each of the enzymes of both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So when we look in the gluconeogenesis direction, we go from right to left. We start with, pyr we start with uh, pyruvate on the far right. We go up now on the black, following the black going backwards. We make phosphoenolpyruvate in two steps. Okay, we come down until we get to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, follow the left arrow leftwards, or the black arrow leftwards, and we get to fructose 6-phosphate, and then we go up to get back to glucose. Now, as I said, she superimposes on these enzymes the allosteric effectors, and there's quite a few. Okay? Positive effectors, positive allosteric regulators of phosphofructokinase are fructose 2,6-bisphosphate that I'll talk about a little bit later today, and AMP. AMP is, a, is an indicator of low energy in cells, and you want to turn on glycolysis when the energy in cells is low, because glycolysis is going to provide intermediates necessary for making energy. So it makes very good sense to have AMP turning on the enzyme. Look at the things that turn it off. ATP turns it off. ATP is an indicator of high energy. Okay? Citrate turns it off. We haven't talked about the citric acid cycle, but I will tell you that when cells are full of energy, they don't run the citric acid cycle. And when the citric acid cycle is not running, what accumulates? Citrate. So citrate is also an indicator of high energy. The last thing that's here are protons. And protons aren't even what I would completely call an allosteric regulator. The reason I wouldn't is because the enzyme phosphofructokinase is extraordinarily sensitive to proton concentration changes. The enzyme just gets knocked out. Okay? So if cells have a very reasonable change in pH, it's the PFK is one of the first enzymes that'll go. And PFK, as you can see, is a pretty critical enzyme in this overall process. Pyruvate kinase, I mentioned last time, is um, regulated both covalently and allosterically. I'm not showing the covalent uh, regulation here. But the allosteric regulation, we see that ATP turns it off. No surprise. We don't want to be making pyruvate if we have plenty of ATP. And alanine turns it off. And alanine is important because alanine is an amino acid made from pyruvate. So if the cell has plenty of alanine, then that means it probably has plenty of pyruvate as well. The feed-forward activator, oh, of course, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's on the left there, is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. As you know, that accumulates as the cells are starting to break down a lot of glucose. And there's a message coming down the pike that, hey, we've got to get some energy going on. And fructose 1,6-bisphosphate helps to communicate that information. On the gluconeogenesis side, pyruvate carboxylase is inhibited, OK, to some extent by ADP and activated to some extent. This, these aren't very strong, by the way, by acetyl-CoA. PEPCK is primarily controlled by the level of whether it's made or not. This is one of those enzymes. I said there were three ways of controlling enzymes. Allosterism, okay. Uh, second was covalent modification, and third was whether or not an enzyme is made. This enzyme is primarily controlled by whether or not it's made. Most cells don't make it. But there is somewhat of an effect of, on, of ADP on this enzyme in places where it is made. Okay, And acetyl-CoA turns it on. ADP turns it off. Uh, I'm sorry, acetyl-CoA turns on the pyruvate carboxylase. And we also see that citrate turns on fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. That's the enzyme going in the uh, gluconeogenesis direction. That's a reciprocal regulator because we saw that uh, a citrate turned off PFK. Reciprocal regulators are where a single thing, usually a molecule, has opposite effects on catabolic and anabolic enzymes. The catabolic enzyme here is PFK. The anabolic enzyme is fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Okay. And finally, the inhibitors of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase are fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. That is the primary reciprocal regulator of these two enzymes. Notice it turns off fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, and it turns on phosphofructokinase. This molecule is present in such tiny quantities in cells that we didn't even know about it until about the 1990s. Okay? Very, very tiny quantities. And the reason it's in very tiny quantities is 
the enzymes are exquisitely sensitive to it. Very tiny amounts of this, of this molecule, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, knocks out fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, okay, and uh, activates the uh, PFK. Okay. So this is a very important molecule. And that's what I'm going to spend a little bit of time in a few minutes talking about how it is made. The last one, the last reciprocal regulator there is AMP. You see AMP turns off fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, uh, bisphosphatase, and activates uh, PFK. Okay. Well, in summary, this is what I just put on that previous screen for you. All right. And we can see the glycolysis enzymes on the top in brown. Reciprocal regulation. Okay. There are the reciprocal regulators right, relating to low energy, high energy. Okay. There's the low energy molecules. The low energy molecules turn off, <coughs> I'm sorry, turn on glycolysis and they turn off gluconeogenesis. If the cell doesn't have the energy, there's no reason to waste even more energy making glucose, so you want to turn off gluconeogenesis. AMP and ADP are both <coughs> excuse me, indicators of low energy. Okay. Indicators of high energy, on the other hand, will tend to turn off glycolysis and turn on gluconeogenesis. Now, glucose 6-phosphate is an indicator of high energy because it tends to accumulate when glycolysis slows down. And when's glycolysis going to slow down? When the reactions aren't, be, when the molecules later in the cycle aren't being used. So glucose 6-phosphate is an indicator of high energy. The high energy indicators turn off glycolysis, they turn on gluconeogenesis. Okay. And last, I have a group that I call other. Now I've mentioned them for other, I've mentioned them pretty much already for the most part. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, very, you notice the double plus sign, the double negative sign, very, very tiny amounts that affect those enzymes uh, very carefully. Alanine, of course, was an indicator uh, of the um, pyruvate level in a cell. And fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, of course, was an indicator that glycolysis is starting up. We've really got to jumpstart this uh, process, so we've got to get past this aldolase. I'm sorry, we've got to get past this aldolase reaction to make this happen, and we get past it by pulling the reactions uh, by activating pyruvate kinase. Okay. Now, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is pretty important for us to understand then. I'm going to tell you, in fact, you look at those last two lines on the screen, and I want you to pay some attention to those because that's going to be important. And the, and the next slide I'm going to show you, which is fairly complicated. And I probably will create another image to, for you to better understand what I'm going to show you on the next slide. I'm going to tell you what's on the next slide, okay? But I will tell you that this is probably the one thing in, this, in the, the class that the students find the most complicated, okay? And that's how it is that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made. Before I get to that, let me say a couple of things. Remember I said that these names are going to all start sounding alike. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. We're going to see there's a fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase. We're going to see there's a PFK2. Okay? And so you've got to keep all these straight. First of all, as I mentioned last time, enzyme names will always end in ASE. So I'm talking about fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase, I'm talking about an enzyme. If I'm talking about fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, I'm talking about a molecule. Okay? Now, the overall guideline here is that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made upon insulin stimulation, and insulin stimulation is going to favor glycolysis. Why does it favor glycolysis? Well, insulin is made when the blood glucose levels rise. Glucose is a poison. Cells take it in. If cells don't do something with that poison, what's going to happen to them? Right? I said you the same gesture I did. That's good. Okay? They're going to use. They're going to. They're going to be in trouble. So cells do two things when they get that glucose, and insulin causes both of them to happen. One is it's going to break it down, reduces the concentration of glucose. The second thing that they're going to do is they're going to put it into glycogen. They're going to synthesize glycogen. Both of those have the effect of reducing glucose concentration. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate okay, is broken down okay, upon glucagon or epinephrine stimulation. Okay? This favors gluconeogenesis. Right? 
favoring gluconeogenesis right, means we're going to be making glucose. Cell levels of glucose are low. And that makes sense because muscle cells are sending the signal, hey guys, there's a grizzly bear chasing us. We need to have glucose. So you want to turn on all pathways that will produce glucose. That's going to include gluconeogenesis. And that's going to include, as we will see, glycogen breakdown. That makes sense? Questions about that? Everybody should have one question at this point. And I don't see any questions. There is something confusing. I just told you, and you all accepted it. Oh, man, now it's going to be one of those kind of days, eh, Hearn? I just told you something confusing. It's, it may even seem completely contrary to what I told you earlier. And nobody wonders about it. Anybody confused by anything? Yes, Ben? So low energy molecules turn on gluconeogenesis, and high energy molecules turn it on. Uh, yeah? Does that confuse you? A little bit. OK, he's a little bit confused. He's in the right track. He's a little bit confused. Anybody else a little bit confused? What did I say earlier about feudal cycles? What's that? Look in the agenesis and glycolysis are a feudal cycle. Why, why did I, what did I say cells try to avoid with feudal cycles? What are they trying to avoid doing? Wasting energy, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yep. You're going to waste energy in making glucose? OK, so he's on the right track. Which, what's your name? I'm sorry? James. James is on the right track, right? I said explicitly that cells avoid having catabolic reactions going on in the same place they have the anabolic reactions going on. Yeah, look what's going on here, OK? I just told you, and Ben is on the right track as well, all right? I just told you that I don't want to have glycolysis and gluconeogenesis going on. Glycolysis is a catabolic process. Gluconeogenesis is an anabolic process. But I also just told you that the things that are favoring breakdown of glucose are favoring the synthesis of glycogen. Catabolic process, anabolic process going on in the same place. Hmm. OK. What do you think the answer is? Why do you think cells are doing this? Yeah. Well, actually, it's, a, a good, it's also on the right track. Okay? Gluconeogenesis is going on in the liver. However, glycogen breakdown is also going on in the liver. The liver is an exception, guys. The liver is there to serve your body. The liver is there to make glucose when needed and make it quickly, and to use glucose quickly and use it quickly. Okay? Your muscles don't have this, these same cycles going on at the same time. You notice that, and this was what somebody over here said, you don't have, for example, okay, gluconeogenesis going on in your muscle cells. It doesn't make sense for your muscle cells to waste energy making glucose if the liver can provide it for them. Okay? So the liver is an exception. The liver is a remarkable exception. And why, when you have liver disease or you have liver problems, you got serious problems, folks, because the liver is your buffer for all of these things. We'll see next term how your liver plays a role in cholesterol in your body. We'll see how your liver plays a role in the uh, uh, metabolism of fatty acids in your body. The liver's got a lot of responsibility. And the liver behaves in a way that other cells of your body really don't. Very important for you to keep in mind. OK? That makes sense? Clear as mud? OK, let's get on to the fun part, eh, Aaron? OK. So that's what's happening there. Now let's look at this figure I promised you. Oh, boy. 
let's focus for a moment okay, on the synthesis of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. That's the top reaction. Fructose 6-phosphate is converted into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate by an enzyme called phos uh, phosphofructokinase 2, or you can call it PFK2. PFK2. And PFT, PFK2 catalyzes that reaction. And, and even though fructose 2,6-bisphosphate sounds like fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, you know, of course, it's not. And so fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is not an intermediate in glycolysis. It's not an intermediate in glycolysis. Okay? Don't confuse it with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. What does fructose 2,6-bisphosphate do? Well, it, it reciprocally regulates glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate stimulates PFK, which we're now going to call PFK1 because we realize there's two different kinds of PFK. By the way, PFK1 makes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fr PFK2 makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So you can see the numbers in terms of keeping track of them. Okay. Well, that's pretty straightforward. What's confusing about that? All right. Energy of ATP is needed to put that second phosphate on, and that's no surprise. We've seen, we saw that with PFK, okay? Well, the confusion comes in is when you look at what that X is beneath the PFK2 in that little triangle. You look beneath there and you see an X on something, and if you look closely at it, you'll see it says FBPase 2. PFK2 is one of the most interesting enzymes that you find in any cell, anywhere. Okay? I'll hope to convince you of that after I tell you what, fruit, what FBPase 2 do, does. FBPase 2 can also be called fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase. Okay? Oh, yeah, oh my God, I heard somebody say, yeah. All right. Write it out, you can keep track of this. Write it out. Fructose, I'm sorry, FBPase 2 catalyzes the opposite reaction. It catalyzes the removal of a phosphate from fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So PFK2 puts the phosphate on. FBPase2 takes the phosphate off. Everybody with me there? A phosphatase takes phosphates off. FBPase2 is a phosphatase. So it takes a phosphate off of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, we make fructose 6-phosphate. Notice that that little attachment, that little line between the triangle and the rectangle for PFK2 and FBPase2 means that they're attached. Both of these activities are in the same big enzyme. And only one is active at any given time. So we, don't, we never have a situation where PFK2 is active at the same time as FBPase2 is active. Only one is active. It's, it's, it's a, a flipped switch. Well, how do we control which one is on and which one is off? Okay. We control it by phosphorylation. Okay. Notice on the right, protein kinase A catalyzes the addition of a phosphate, and when it puts the phosphate on, it puts it onto the PFK2 part, and that knocks the enzyme out. That leaves the FBPase2 active. Anybody remember when protein kinase A is activated? What kind of hormone stimulates activation of protein kinase A? Epinephrine, yep. Glucagon. So we see that FBPase2 is active. We see FBPase2 is knocking out fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. We eliminate fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. We're going to activate gluconeogenesis. Because if there's no fructose 2,6-bisphosphate to inhibit F1,6-BPase, then gluconeogenesis is going to occur. What takes the phosphate off? Well, what takes the phosphate off is a phosphatase. And the phosphatase that takes it off is phosphoprotein phosphatase. And what stimulates phosphoprotein phosphatase? Insulin. This is why insulin has the opposite effect 
on glucose metabolism compared to epinephrine. It all comes down to these reactions that you see on the screen. This is why these two pathways are diametrically opposed to each other depending upon whether glucose is, depending upon whether uh, insulin is present or epinephrine is present. Now I know that takes a while to absorb. I'm going to make another figure for you that I hope will also explain it in an, in, in an alternate way for you to better understand. But if you get confused with this, come see me. I'd be happy to explain it to you. All right? But most importantly, what I will tell you is start writing it out. You start writing this out, and it will, it will make sense to you. But at first, it's like, oh my god, all these names sound the same. Is that a question, or are you just scratching your head? Scratching your head, okay. That's okay, it's okay to scratch your head. Your head. Okay. Question back here. Are we going to distinguish between the action of epinephrine and glucagon? Uh, basically, no. I will tell you the difference. Epinephrine works on both liver and muscle. Glucagon only works on liver. Yep. If you think about it, that sort of makes sense too, because epinephrine is the danger, and so you want the muscles to be really most active in that danger. But since muscles aren't involved in making um, glucose, then glucagon isn't, a, isn't a, 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 an important consideration for them. Yes? Does epinephrine work on all muscle cells? Um, you mean all the different types of muscle cell? I think they're mostly skeletal muscle cells, but that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would suspect it would probably have some minimal effect on heart and so forth because you want the heart to beat uh, more forcefully. Uh, but smooth muscle, I don't know. I don't know. Good question. Okay. Let's do one more thing. And the one more thing is actually easy. And this is cool. This is the part where it all starts to come together. All right? Let's imagine, OK, if you will, that I am a, I'm being chased by that grizzly bear. And I start running as fast as I can to get away from the grizzly bear. I've already told you one thing in this class, OK? I've told you one thing in this class that gives an immediate replacement for the ATP lost on the muscular contraction. What is it? Creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate runs that reaction backwards, makes ATP. You have instantaneous ATP as soon as you start to break down ATP by running or jumping or whatever. Okay. Well, that works as long as you have creatine phosphate, but that doesn't last real long either. So you want to have a delivery system to make sure that the muscles are getting the glucose that they need. And that's particularly important when you're running for a longer distance. Because when you're running for a longer distance, your muscle cells use oxygen faster than your blood supply can deliver it. Well, you know, OK, well, I remember he said we go through fermentation. We go through fermentation when oxygen is low, because that helps to regenerate NAD so we can keep glycolysis going. However, it also means we've got, to run, we've got to burn 15 to 19 times more glucose to generate the same amount of ATP. That's going to take a lot of glucose, folks. Where's that glucose going to come from? It's coming from right here. So this is part of a, a cycle we call the Cori cycle. The Cori cycle is very cool. We start at the very top here in muscle. The muscle cell starts contracting. The grizzly bear is chasing. You start breaking down glucose, what glucose that the muscle cell has. Okay? Epinephrine will kick in here as well, because epinephrine says I'm being chased, and your muscle cells do have glycogen. They will start breaking glycogen down. That's why epinephrine is important for them. Okay? You break the glucose down, and you're running long enough, and you start running out of oxygen. You're probably starting to run out of glucose, because it's taking 15 to 19 times more glucose to make the same amount of ATP. So your body says, well, we can't not do glycolysis because we've got to keep running. So the body says, OK, we're switching to fermentation mode. We don't have enough oxygen. We convert pyruvate into lactate. Lactate is a dead end as far as the muscle cells are concerned. They can't do anything with it. Moreover, lactic acid accumulates. There may be problems associated with that accumulation. You've already seen that PFK, for example, is sensitive to protons. So we want to be careful we don't have too many protons around here. The muscle cells export 
the lactate. They get rid of it. They throw it out. It goes out into the bloodstream. And in the bloodstream, it goes right back to your favorite organ, the liver. And the liver has plenty of oxygen. The liver is right next to your lungs. It gets a very good supply of oxygen. Okay? The liver can therefore run the lactate reaction backwards to make pyruvate. And further, since the liver has all these fats and fatty acids stored away that you've been accumulating over the years, it's got plenty of energy to convert that pyruvate into glucose. Glucose isn't needed by the liver. The liver dumps it into the bloodstream where it goes out to the muscles. And so you've just now completed a cycle. And it looks like a futile cycle, but it's not a futile cycle. At least not the way I've defined one before. Why is this not a futile cycle? Megan? Not occurring in the same cells. One part of our body is supporting the other part of our body. Our liver is always bailing us out. Our liver is bailing us out here again as the grizzly bear is chasing us. Pretty awesome. Okay, I think that's enough before we have some fun. So let's have a little fun. I've got two songs uh, for us today. And the two songs... How many people are going to the football game this weekend? Okay, this is the Civil War weekend. Not a lot of football fans, but at least some. And this is the time of the year when everybody starts thinking about Benny Beaver. Okay? Now, how many people are aware of the Beaver Genome Project? How many people are aware of few? Oh, maybe more than are going to the football game. <laughs> okay, so that's good. So OSU Beaver had its genome, or is in the process of having its genome sequenced right now, okay? Um, and the uh, beaver will be the first Pac-12 mascot to have its sequence completely determined. Yes, yes. So last year when they decided they were going to sequence the beaver genome, they asked me if I would write a song about it, and I did, okay? So the song we're going to sing is the beaver genome song. And it's about that sequencing effort. I, think, I hope you'll enjoy it. It's to the tune of an old country song called Red River Valley. And we're all going to sing it together. In Corvallis, a lovable mascot Wonders why he's the way that he is Everyone that he meets has one answer It relates to the sequencing biz Engineers say that Benny's amazing Building dams of incredible strength And his front teeth are worthy of praising Growing to an incredible length Why is our college mascot so daunting While the others like ducks are so meek DNA in the cells of our Benny Is what makes all of his traits unique so our beaver will soon get his answers to the questions revealing unknowns. There will be all the info he's after in the sequence of his full genome. Okay, that's the beaver song. There's actually a video on YouTube if you're interested that has that and also has the beaver genome project. Now I said I promised you two songs. And the second song, I've been talking about grizzly bears all term long, so I thought we'd have our grizzly bear song, which is uh, to the it, it, energy to the tune of an old Beatles song called Let It Be. This is a fairly long one, okay? So bear with me. When I was walking through the forest, grizzly bears came after me, so I was badly needing energy. My body dumps some epinephrine out into the blood for me Cause I was badly needing energy Energy, 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 energy I was badly needing energy 
The epinephrine gave a kick to enzymes deep inside of me to make a bunch of cyclic AMP. And when this hit my protein kinase, catalytic ecstasy, the C subunits started adding peas, adding peas, adding peas, adding peas, adding peas. Adding peas. Phosphorylation city, adding peas. The protein kinase put a phosphate onto PBK for me, using energy from ATP. And PBK in turn converted Bs to As and Is to Ds, so I released a ton of G1P. G1P energy. G1P energy. California needs some G1P. They had an energy crisis in California a few years ago when I wrote this. <laughs> True story. And when the chaos had subsided, I consumed some Frito Lays, which soon began reversing these pathways. The glucose halted epinephrine, insulin began the race to turn on phosphoprotein, phosphatase, phosphatase cleaves the peas, phosphatase cleaves the peas, dephosphorylation cleaves the peas. And so they were removed from action, cellular kinases. Thanks to phosphoprotein phosphatase. I'll tell my story here before I get depressed from one last fact that dephosphorylation favors fat. Favors fat, favors fat, favors fat, favors fat. Favors fat. Dephosphorylation favors fat. Happy Turkey Day, everyone.